and I'm Javid. This morning, I'll be bringing you Chi Talks with co-host uh, Tony Khalife, and guest today is Nari. If everything's made of energy, we have a lot to discuss. Let's dive right in. Well, good morning, Javi. Good morning. Good morning, Nari. Good morning, Tony G and Javi. Thanks for coming in today. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm going to adjust your level here a little bit. Check one. Check one. How are we Check. doing? Okay. That sounds great. All right. Coming in loud and clear. Taking a little sip of coffee. Yes, that's right. <laughs> coffee is very useful this morning. Yeah. What, yeah. Do you, what do you have, Nari? Water. Water? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Good old H2O. H2O with whatever salt is. Ah, yes. Now he doesn't do any of the accelerants of any sort that uh, I, I, I personally practice sometimes. In yeah. The <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's good. That's a conscious practice. This is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, keep that awareness, though, at least, huh? Uh-huh. Yeah. That's right. That's I, right. I've actually gotten, I've gotten a little bit into coffee myself. Never grew up drinking it and never, you know, work or school or anything like that. Never use it. Actually, the only times I kind of used um, uh, this drug when it was when I needed to drive like do airport runs, you know, like being up on the hill. Sometimes you'd have to do like 3 a.m. airport runs to get there at 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. or pick up someone at 6 a.m. or something like that. And then coming back, it's like it's at least a, a with, with, you know, two and a half hours to the to the airport. It's at least, you know, a three hour round, no, six hour round trip. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, the, the Chinese, they say that uh, drinking coffee is borrowing energy from tomorrow. Basically. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, no, I, I actually weaned myself off of coffee the past, uh, the past four or five months. And, and now I only do it on, uh, when I need an accelerated process, uh -huh. and, which is one of them is today. Is uh -huh, uh -huh. Been out, we've been out in uh, Mount Shasta for the past couple of days. And then we got in a little late yesterday and I personally woke up a little tired. So I'm borrowing energy from tomorrow for gotcha. today. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, keep us on, on track. I like that. Never heard that borrowing energy from from tomorrow <laughs> well um what are we talking about well, today you know i i just gotta say before we start yeah. that i am absolutely excited to have nari g here with us today i and i and i say that for many reasons first uh you know we uh you know me my partner and i live with nari okay. in, uh, on the ranch okay second uh just uh i i would say personally that nari g is my most favorite people in, in <laughs> southern humble for Aww. many of not just because we live together well actually because we live together because i actually get to see you in action Ooh. and get to see what kind of what level of attention you have to details in terms of in terms of uh, being a great host in terms mm. of being in terms of your detail and your attention to the land and also your the depth of love you have to your community and how you show up to your community so and uh nari g the 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 g at the end is for reverence you know so uh, nari and uh g so she gave you the same tony g yes well, it's uh, it's mutual reverence, mutual the, reverence, the Namaste aspect. Okay. You know, I bow to the divine in you. You bow to the divine in me. So, Expl and you're Haviji. Haviji. Ex <laughs> okay. Explain the G a little bit. Is this like, kind of like Baba G? Yes, correct. Oh, exactly. Okay. Okay. It's a it's a, uh, it's a syllable that's added to your la to your name in in the Hindu tradition in order to give you more reverence. So. Let, let's let's hear a little bit about uh, the story, how you guys came together and uh, how you came to be on the same land. Um, we know already Tony's story, but we want to hear today Nari's story. Yes. But obviously the the uh, stories uh, interweave, no? Yes. 
<laughs> Nari, just like give us give us a little uh, lowdown of how you made it all the way to Garberville and to Nielsen Ranch. <laughs> well, specifically to Nielsen Ranch, living on Nielsen Ranch has been eleven years now, and. Um, I arrived there. Our yoga community actually purchased it as a place for our yogi to mm. live and to um, live his last years there. And this he did. <laughs> and when he died, then um, I had been living there already for three years or so. Uh, and I continued to live there. So that's how I got there. I came to this area for the, the yoga. Um, like, uh, I, I think, uh, Javi, you were, when you all say up the mountain or up the hill, that mm. was Dr. Young's place? Yes. Yeah, it was um, a, a center of sorts uh, where he lived, and there are three living structures. And uh, about four years ago, Tony's partner, uh, came to live on the land, and a year later, she was needing to leave and go do something, and she asked him to come as a sort of a placeholder, <laughs> take care of the garden and, and whatever um, whatever work, save a work exchange work um, she was doing at the time to have him do that for the month, and well... I don't think he left. No, I did not leave after that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he left. <laughs> so Tony has graced the land with his lovely presence, um, offering uh, the Bagua practice, which is something that I have been joining him with and really appreciating the level of energy connection that it gives and what I really appreciate and, and see in all of the practices because I've also uh, practiced uh, Florina's Qigong is to to see the similarities in the practices and their foundations are all in the energy and it's it's easy to get um, what's the word easy to get seduced by the physical practice, you know, the actual form and, and the movements, and to learn to feel that the, there's the energy below it, and that's what is really driving it. Um, so I, I really, I appreciated the Bagua practice right away. It was it's pretty fantastic. Then you uh, you definitely have your uh, your hands in chi continuously, and also you teach yoga on a regular basis in town at the Dharma Center on Thursdays and Saturdays, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think where uh, where the two world intersect, they really intersect in the idea of chi and prana. Prana is mm -hmm. the Hindu way of saying the energy in the body, which is the the breath that we take in in order to give us more energy, the very conscious breath that we practice in uh, multiple modalities in order to enhance our chi, mm -hmm. you know, so. So you bring up a wonderful point because it's something that for me has been fascinating about the Chinese practices and something that I love utilizing as a practice, and Tony G, you can talk a little bit more about what you've been exploring um, as well. Ha the the Chinese system and the yogic system seem to have a little bit of opposites when it comes to breath. Hmm. So for me, it's a very conscious practice when I'm in the the Chinese practice to breathe the way that is shared with me, that breathe in on this movement, breathe out on that movement. And it will, I would say, 85 to 90 percent of the time be the opposite of what I naturally go to from having practiced the, the yoga. Mm. And so I love it because it makes, well, of course, it makes our brains think, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and 
it's not that it's always right or always wrong in the the hatha yoga it's simply uh, the natural way that we follow there will be the opposite breath at certain times but it's only certain times mm -hmm. so i've been enjoying that aspect mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me and then uh tony g has been most enjoyable for me he's been exploring some breath work for his own uh, life and um, has been incorporating that into the bagua and it is more of the yogic breath where it's in through the nose out through the nose mm -hmm. and so it's been interesting hearing his process and how that how that has um I'll call it increased the capacity or increased I don't know you can say more about it Tony what your experience is right and I and I think uh you know Javi has a lot to offer to you about the breath right the you know the the approach the martial approach to breath takes on a different different quality continuously and uh, if you're delivering power you you use your breath entirely different than if you are activating the healing modality of the breath so um, in that context uh, we, we explored a variety of different way of breathing and most importantly that when you are engaged in your practice, the natural practice, you're really following your own modality of where you intake and outtake the breath. Mm. And um, you're, you're coordinating your actions accordingly. And uh, in, in the, the days when we used to practice, uh, when I used to practice asanas, yeah, there was, a, there was more of a, of a synchronized way of breathing with the asanas, with the movement, with the vinyasa. And... Um, there, there is something similar too in martial arts and in Bagua. Uh, it's, but it doesn't hold that same, that same, uh, I would say that same structure because you are you are moving. Bagua has a tremendous element of improvisation, and uh, you are present in the circle. And the circle, what you're trying to do is you're trying to maintain a, a an accurate way of breathing, but simultaneously you're also doing tremendous changes in your moves. And those changes are also accompanied by in and out breath and sometimes quicker breath, sometimes more of a prolonged breath, depending on, on how you're exercising your chi. But the most important thing of, of all the practices that have breath as the foundation is the breath has to be going in through the nose most importantly and in qigong we say breath through the mouth is dead breath because mm -hmm. it doesn't go through the cavities it does it's not being cooled it's not being uh reviving the because as as you know the the nose has it's like a uh, i don't know it's like so it's got so many cavities and as the breath travels through there it does much more than just air it's filtered it is it cools it cools the brain it's accessed a lot quicker than if you're taking breath through the mouth and uh, so but then how you put the breath out is dependent on whether you're exercising your power externally or you're trying to harness the power internally so if you want to maintain an internal harnessing of the of the power that would be breathing again out through the nose so then you have more of a of a circular breathing that comes through the nose all the way in and then comes back out through the nose and uh, but if you're putting energy out and you're actually exerting energy out then the mouth would give you the the exhalation would give you a lot more presence and a lot a quicker way of trying to get to that power place than mm -hmm. taking mm -hmm. your time trying to exhale through the nose because as you know extending through the nose is also a very conscious slower practice as opposed to putting all of your energy out through the mouth because you could empty your lungs in less than a second if you open your mouth but it will take you four or five seconds to get it out of your nose and uh, if you're confronted with a, a power power movement or power encounter you might not have five seconds to breathe out through the nose you'd already be on the ground so that would be a totally different story 
Mm-hmm. I just want to I just want to say for folks that are just tuning in, this is uh, Chi Talks with Javi. Uh, that's Tony, and we're here with Nari this morning, and um, we're just sitting around talking about breathing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you do you guys often just sit around talking about breathing? <laughs> Occasionally, yeah. it happens. <laughs> It's it's really interesting. Well, the breath brings you into awareness sometimes if you are uh, predisposed to like to awareness and to the practices and just having that self-awareness. Um, yeah, you know, I have my own, own own journey with watching breath, right? So uh, Nari was just sharing that Tony and Nari they live on the same um, uh, property. Property. And it's really interesting to live together, have a practice together, and be of these practices. Uh, I, I found, you know, like on the mountain, um, far different from how many of us sort of live. Often we organize our lives and our, our, um, where we live, how we live you know, with like a roommate situation or with like a partner, a girlfriend, boyfriend or something like that. Or once we, you know, move out of the family, but to come together with an intention similar to like you, Nari, uh, I don't know the whole story about how your yogi and, and you, you know, came together, but to have that experience where there's an intention, you know, for you and the yogi to live on the same uh, land and understand, you know, where that, what all will will happen in terms of, you know, death and then um, continuing the practice. And it, it there's already an element and a presence that's on the land and the property in the space. And then to have layered on that, um, Tony um, and his partner there with the awareness, the presence, the practice, bringing that to the space. You have conversations like this where you're going into nuances of breathing and awareness. Yes, yes. <laughs> we do we do a lot together, actually, Nariji and I. We have, we share we share the Bagua. We share also Kirtan. We uh, yes. we, we do a lot of chanting together. But the the thing that is absolutely mm-hmm. remarkable about uh, that I'm getting to learn so much from Nariji and I share with uh, a few times a week is land management mm. and and. Um, would love to hear your your uh, uh, your wisdom about managing the land because I have I've I've lived at some really amazing very fabulous places in my life and uh, but I've never witnessed anybody that has the depth the attention and also the energy to sustain mm. on the land and I've I've seen you work day and night you definitely outwork to anybody including me <laughs> uh, in, uh, uh, in for years now I see you out there in the morning I see you in the afternoon I see you midday you guide all of us in what to do you also bring in um, a lot of experts you bring in a lot of people to do work on the land your your commitment to the land is is remarkable is just beyond anything i've seen so i would love to to hear how that feeds you and how that yes you know comes to be such a such an empowering place an encouraging place for all of us to just look at and go wow what i want to be like you when i grow up (laughs) and we're the same age (laughs) (laughs) yes indeed are you (laughs) yeah we are Um, I'd I guess, love to hear that. Too. I, I guess you can say I'm older than he is. Oh, okay, <laughs> two <laughs> months, three uh, months, three months, something like that. <laughs> um, yeah. Wow. What a what a big question. Um, it definitely feeds my soul to be on the land. No question. Uh, the quiet that's out there, the peace that's there. I never imagined that I would be a person to appreciate that. Uh, Certainly I do. And it's – I can say that when I first moved there, I I feel like I got trial by fire, so to speak. So uh, we were – 
it was June and there had been a new drip system put into the garden. And you have to imagine this garden is quite large. Uh, we don't tend it the way we used to, but rather large. A lot it's of still canning. large, by the way. Yeah, it's still <laughs> large, but we don't actually tend all of it. So this drip system was put in, and I got to the land, and, and literally as I was leaving, the person who was putting it in was on her way out. So that's where it was. So nobody had ever used this system. And I think they started watering with it. There were two people living on the land at that time. And oh my goodness, after they watered, it looked like we had a leak or something. The water use was so tremendous. So that's where it started. And okay, so how do you diagnose a water system? Well, that was my job all of a sudden. Mm. And you have to understand that I hadn't lived off the grid yet. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I was out in Briceland uh, on the grid. So yes, it was. it's a matter of learning what there is to do. And if there's not somebody else to do it, well... You learn it. So it was very empowering. Mm -hmm. Also, it can be daunting. And so learning how to, uh, how to approach the issues that come up one at a time or talk to people who know or find somebody, hire somebody if, if I can, who knows how to do something. Um, and it's, so it's been a very empowering exercise, I'll call it, uh, for me. And it utilizes, I'm a physical person, so I enjoy going out and doing work. Uh, it utilizes that skill. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a problem solver as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. uh, and something that I have really learned in my adult life is when you know how something works, you're able to address what issues are and problems that show up. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I didn't know about myself that I had the capacity and the skill for. So it's been very empowering. Well, I mean, I, I've watched you fix lawn mowers and uh, <laughs> mm, weed, weed right? whackers and uh, uh, water pumps. And, exactly. Uh, uh, all kinds of stuff, you know. <laughs> and I say, who knew? <laughs> yeah, right? So for me, like, you know, I for a lot of us, well, me, you know, I'm in my 40s. I grew up, you know, sort of post-industrial. A lot of things come with the push of a button. Right. <laughs> right? Or, yeah, you know, hire hire someone and have them come and fix it. Yeah. So for me also to go off grid and to have all of these systems, water, electric, and whatnot, and having to learn, learn and understand and diagnose, it's definitely a process, and it takes time. It does. <laughs> Take time, yeah, yeah. Not to mention that being on the hill, it, a lot, <clears throat> a lot doesn't get to you in time. And I remember we've been we dealt with the solar system for f two years before we got any help. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and and that's and I put this out there to people who are listening. If you have a skill that you can offer, uh, make it known. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yes, because there are a lot, a lot of the work that there is to do there. I would happily have somebody there to do it. Especially, I notice that as I age, mm. that the energy that I have for this work diminishes. There's just no question. Um, I know it was. Let's see. I think it's been eight years ago now I had been working at Bembo as a server there um, as well as living on the land and and um, I do bookkeeping work as well. So had, having that gig but realizing that after I was alone on the land that my energy for serving two to three days a week just wasn't what I had the energy for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I decided – Mm, okay, mm -hmm. it is time. Let go of that and focus the that attention and the energy, uh, that physical energy, onto the land. And it 
it for me it's um it's rewarding so i enjoy it and that's why i do it and uh i don't know if you've been on the land javi but mm-hmm. the land is pristine mm-hmm. i guess yeah no i haven't been on yeah. y'all's just the neighboring the neighboring property right. yeah but we you we've, should come and visit because no, we talked about then that. you will understand the the refinement i'm talking about oh, and I'm addressing okay oh it's brilliant it's really uh the just the clearing and just it just looks really absolutely divine this brings us to a really uh a great opportunity that that i've wanted to explore and it's the marrying of these land processes with the caretaking of the land and the caretaking of the self if you will mm-hmm. we call it stewarding stewarding okay. the land yes mm-hmm. and and i would say also you know in terms of my experience as well and watching being aware the stewarding of the self uh is uh, there's often overlapping principles um what specifically have you noticed in those overlap <sighs> well you ha you as the observer you always see what comes to awareness are those <clears throat> quote unquote um areas of opportunity mm-hmm. <laughs> those mm-hmm. things that are jumping at you that are like you got to take care of this and so in the body the pain signals those opportunities and on the land well what signals those i guess you know a uh, uh, like you said, a water leak or uh, 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 an energy <laughs> leak, right. an energy leak or uh, a, a fallen tree, uh, something like that. And yeah. And, and then so here comes the, the steward, the steward, the caretaker. Right. 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 Uh, interesting perspective way to look at it for sure. And yeah, as the steward. You're the one that has the eyes and the attention and the awareness to see what needs taken care of. And as the caretaker of yourself, then it's up to you to uh, to engage or to find out what needs to be engaged in order to take care of it. And I know for myself, I had just a little over a year ago, probably a year and a half ago, I had an issue that came up in my sacrum. And I went to physical therapy. And what I found is that when I did those exercises on a regular basis, I healed the issue. And now sometimes it shows up again, and I have only to, and and that's the, as you said, the pain signal in the body reminding me, oh, right, Mm -hmm. I need to take care of this. I need to take care of myself Mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. And that pain there is, we call it the teacher. Mm -hmm. The pain is the teacher. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's there to, to signal us. Yes. And it is, that is the opportunity. Yeah. I mean, the land, the land, asks of you more than sometimes your body can handle you know and oh. uh, it's really up to you to make certain steps that are going to be conscious it's up to you to know when to just like pull back and when to move forward and uh and you never know <laughs> you never know what what the result is going to be and how it's going to affect you and uh i uh, uh before i uh, before i moved up on the land with nariji and my partner Shiva, I uh, my Bagua practice was sometimes four hours a day, mm. and uh, since I've been more engaged in the land and uh, more participating in in getting that feedback from nature, I've been, I've been realizing that's a greater Bagua than the Bagua that I practice. Very simply, because you are present in the land, you are you put in your effort, and your effort is being given back. And uh, sometimes it's it's intoxicating that uh, you know you go beyond yourself and then you're working and you're loving it and then you know two hours later you mm-hmm. yeah oh mm-hmm. god I pushed it so those have been great lessons and um, 
Uh, and there's always, you know, I think it's seasonal also what your body goes through, right? And then, and it's also seasonal what the forest is going through. It's also seasonal the, the work that you're doing in order to maintain that harmony with the land. And uh, it starts like, like, it starts like any other thing that you've started after you've been doing before, but you haven't done in six months. Like going on a run after you haven't ran in six months, mm -hmm. you know, you're sore the first two, three days, mm -hmm. but then you start to gain that chi back and then mm -hmm. everything kind of synchronizes and now you're running. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, when the winter season comes and it's, it's about raking the forest and the lateral movement is, uh, is, you know, the body gets, gets a little creaky with it. <laughs> Every year it's a little bit more creaky. <laughs> And uh, yeah. and every year it gets uh, the healing process gets maybe prolonged a little bit, and instead of healing after two days, it's maybe two and a half days. Mm -hmm. But then, but then you gain so much more because now you've kind of overcome yourself. And yeah, it took you two and a half days to heal, but now you're raking. You're raking with more vigor. You spend the next six months up until you can't burn anymore, mm -hmm. raking every other day. And yeah, yeah that's that's a great bagua. That's, that's a much greater bhagwa than just walking in circles and with mm. your arms empty, in a sense. And then chopping wood. The, the, the quintessential mm. yeah. mantra for living off-grid is chop wood, carry water. Right. So, uh, you know, I've just recently been uh, been trying to heal from chopping wood, yeah. for example. Yeah. You know, that impact that, you know, going down with the axe, splitting the wood, and then the wood doesn't want to split. And then so you're like... Oof. You know, so there's that engagement. You're going back and forth. A challenge. It is a challenge. <laughs> but when it splits, you're like, oh, look at this pile I just did. But we had the splitter working, which it was, it was dormant for a while. And now the pile of wood is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, it's 9.34. Uh, this is uh, Chi Talks. You got it tuned to the mud. And I'm Javi. This is Tony and Nari. And I'm really enjoying where this conversation is going. Um, one of the things that you brought up earlier was the 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 journey of knowing, learning, and diagnosing. Mm -hmm. And you talked about like that on on the land. And Tony, you were saying that how uh, a friend of mine uh, who's passed uh, said, uh, you know, had that saying, uh, "Master of none." Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget how it how it goes, but all of these things and skills that that the land the land management requires is similar to the body. How do you know how to address something if you're not given the 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 knowledge? What do you mean by not given the knowledge? Well, uh, you know, so for example, you go to the physical therapist and they give you. They give you the knowledge, you give you the step one, step two, step three to address or alleviate. Gotcha. And, you know, you could have gone probably, how many, I don't know, five to 10 years trying to explore, get in or whatnot. And boom, you know, it's like hiring the person to fix the splitter or the mower or something, right? <laughs> Of course, nowadays we have, what do they call it? Dr. Google. Yeah. YouTube. YouTube. <laughs> Dr. Google. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can, or YouTubes or wherever yeah. it takes you. But uh, for me is, it's the body itself. Mm -hmm. We have, each of us has a connection to, to that knowledge. And it is helpful to have assistance from outside people who have had experience with something that can take us on the straight path boom right to there right. that's super helpful uh, or sometimes we might need body work or the chiropractor or whatever it is to help us in our in our uh, search and to utilize their experience and their knowledge Ultimately, we know. Our bodies know and our bodies will tell us what's necessary. Um, this is why, uh, although Tony G uh, said that I uh, teach yoga, we don't really teach. Mm. Uh, it's sharing. I share mm -hmm. my experience. I share what has worked for me. 
Uh, and sometimes I gain other knowledge, which is how the body works, because when I was talking about learning how things work, that's another aspect of it when you bring it to the body, anatomy. So we know that certain muscles do certain things in our bodies. Um, I may not have the experience of when something specific is not working properly in my body, knowing what that's going to look like. Uh, so that's why for me, going to the physical therapist, super helpful. Uh, I could probably have come to every single one of those exercises that I was given on my own. I probably could have, mm -hmm. and you probably can, and you probably can, mm -hmm. and anyone with, in a body probably can. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a matter of being willing to pay attention, and that's what we're talking about with the land, is it's really about paying attention. Mm -hmm. And giving it the attention, our time, our focus. Um, I was listening to something the other day, and they were saying, if you do all these practices, uh, that'll be about this amount of time during your week. And I remember somebody somewhere, sometime, saying, s s talking about exercise and he said great so now this means that if i'm going to uh, if i'm going to deal with whatever the issue was that he had going on i have to spend all this time wasted on mm, doing these practices this exercise mm -hmm. and it all depends on your perspective mm -hmm. so it's i i feel like we already have that intuitive knowledge and it's a connection to it that's the missing part and the breath whatever our practice is will take us to it there's a little bit of a faith and a and a confidence to be able to go inside yourself too and maybe that comes you know with time with that searching exploration trial error can i address something can mm -hmm. i not and there's a place that says, well, why not simply try it? Yeah. Why not? Mm -hmm. Also, Naraji, you, you ask the right questions, too. You know, you've developed a level of uh, uh, awareness that can, can pinpoint how to frame a question in order to get the, the correct answers. Oh, and, I'm still playing there. Oh, like, yeah, most <laughs> certainly. I, mean, I think it's, it's a never-ending practice for sure. <laughs> yes. But at the same time, you are uh, definitely present. I mean, your your awareness is not just to that which needs to be done. Also, your awareness is how do you ask the right questions in order to get the correct answers? And uh, if you did not get the right answer, you reframe your question. And you, uh, you, mm. you, you've done that in real time with me multiple times. Mm. Bhagwan, and, like in... Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You okay. know, the capacity to correct oneself, I think... Mm. To, to have the awareness to be able to correct yourself and be able to be present in mm. your own activity, in your own thought, in your own way of moving through the world. I think that is what all of these practices are trying to build in us, to develop in mm. us the capacity to ask ourselves the correct question yeah. and the capacity to be able to, are we doing this right? Yeah. Is this what we need? Is this mm -hmm. something that we are going is going to lead us to the outcome that is the desirable outcome or is it just going to send us, you know, down a hill? Let me ask you guys a question. Do you have a sitting practice? Currently, I don't. Okay. Um, I came to to a spiritual practice by taking a meditation course. That was my start of the spiritual practice. How and long ago? That was I was about twenty four. Okay. And I just had a sense that it would be good for me. Sure. And uh, I'm a person with a very active mind, oh, okay. uh, analytical. I can be overly analytical. Mm -hmm. And there was something you said a little bit earlier, Javi, that 
I I found interesting You've been about <laughs> You've been that I've been about? thinking about <laughs> since then that I found really interesting. And you said there's always we're we're looking at what there is to do, and and it's the mind is looking at that. Mm-hmm. And so for me to be aware of what my mind is doing at any given time is. Uh, it's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And to realize that I walk through, I take a walk and I take a walk always looking at, okay, next we're going over here and we're doing this, that, and the other and allowing that mind to take a break. Yeah. So for me, the practices, the, the true meditation is when we're able to then bring it into our life. So it's fine, the Hatha Yoga, the Bhagwa, the Qigong, the mm-hmm. meditation, all of it is great, good, and wonderful, not knocking it at all. It is a means to live your life in from that place, to be able to walk through life as a meditation. So there uh-huh. are times when I will use the tool. So these are tools, the meditation, the the Bhagwa, the Qigong, the, the Hatha Yoga. For me, they're all tools, just like my breath practice are, is a tool to, to life lived as a meditation. Well, no, I appreciate that. I totally resonate with that as well. You know, <laughs> you know, from, <clears throat> from the, 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 sitting practice it's easy and and once you know life gets you going it's easy to beat yourself up about not doing your sitting practice totally as a training martial artist um it's easy to beat myself up about not going back and doing all of my form practice Mm -hmm. and then this interesting thing happens with the land where the land calls the land calls you right and now you're able to overlap all these all these things in in a way, in a sense, and uh, uh, sort of harmonize those desires you have, those uh, practices, as you said, tools, and then bring those in into into real life. What a gift! And the land gives you the opportunity uh, for for all of that. Absolutely. Lovely, well said. Yeah, I'm just sort of thinking out loud here. <laughs> it, it is it is tremendously rewarding. Again, you know, like you're you're sitting outside, you're in the presence of that which is the most present in your life. And that's where you're getting your sunshine from. As you're getting your your uh, what's feeding you. That's the breath that you're that you're taking and uh, you're not you're not sitting there just trying to muster all of that up within yourself in a meditative posture, trying to imagine all of this and trying to have an internal conversation to lead you there. You're already present there, and uh, you're infusing your chi along with the earth. So the the benefits are definitely outweigh the effort, I would say. You know, definitely. What do you, what do you think about this idea? It's like, you know, why are we so drawn to the trees and the hills and, you know, the views and the mountains? And it's like, I often think, you know, I walk through the same loop with the, with the same, the same trees and they're just there doing their thing. They're just there (laughs) doing their thing. They're not going here. They're not going there. They're, you know, they're not visiting family. They're not, you know, they're already there where we're trying to, where we're all trying to go. They're just, they're just present. Right. They're just present there in this in their in their one spot. They're already doing what it is like I'm trying to do or where I'm trying to go, where I'm trying to be, you know what I'm saying? Well that's why you go for a walk so that you can they can impart their wisdom. Right. <laughs> that's beautiful. I Most love certainly. It. But also, you know, they're they're already going some places with their roots, you know. Mm-hmm. They're already yes. this is true. The, they're just going there grabbing this root, grabbing yes. that root, communicating. Yes. And then I think I think all nature acts on behalf of that which is already healthy and exuberant and balancing. I think us humans are the only deluded individuals on this planet that try to mess things up for the natural process. And I think I think we're 
we're just a little confused about nature and uh, ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I feel like you bring up a good point, Tony G, and that is learning to get quiet enough so that you can align yourself to the divine will. That's, mm. for me, what the meditative practices are. Um, and any of these physical practices as well, so that we can learn to connect to that energy, which is infinitely, um, what's the word, infinitely wise, mm. sage. And accessible. And accessible, yeah. I mean, it's super simple if we simply... Transformative. Yeah, and transformative, yeah, and all we need to do is get quiet, and it's there. Yeah, so I mean, that's what uh, makes it accessible. Uh, uh, absolutely, and I think I think quiet in in so many different ways, and uh, indeed having the nurtured mind in order to allow that quietude to lead you to answers and to presence and to awareness. That's that's another cultivated practice. You don't just, I mean, you might come into the world with that um, and they might get robbed out of you, but mainly, mainly, ultimately, the end result of all of this is to have that kind of balance and that kind of a reception with the natural world and which automatically gives you the connection to your natural self. So Tony Ju, what is your practice that Javi asked our our practices, sitting practice or whatever that might be? What what would you say for you? For me is songwriting and uh, I think I think uh, it's uh, uh, the quietness in uh, that I'm seeking is really more the resolution that I'm seeking within the thoughts and the and the impulses that uh, continuously arise from being a musician, you know, I'm, in the, I'm continuously in the act of producing vibration. And uh, uh, my voice is uh, uh, continuously being the aspect that I'm working on. So I'm, I'm always putting breath through my vocal folds and I'm creating vibration. And that, uh, that prompts a lot of different uh, ideas and a lot of different situations that sometimes uh, require resolution, require uh, uh, movement forward, transformation. And uh, I would say my silent practice is very vocal. You know? <laughs> so I, uh, I rare, I'm rarely quiet, I would say, because uh, uh, I, I listen a lot and then I'm always making vibration. And uh, uh, even when I'm quiet, I'm listening to my breath, so I don't consider myself quiet anymore because my breath is very, um, very present. But ultimately, ultimately, it's a, there's this current going that way, and simultaneously, there's an equal current that's coming, coming also that is has has a level of uh, silence and restfulness to it that allows for the answers or the transformation or the movement forward to occur. And I do see a lot of progress in all of my thoughts and all of my activities and uh, in uh, my efforts in whatever I'm doing, I always see progress. And sometimes there's, there are more depletions than there are movement forward, but that also, that also comes to a composting sense oh. and then becomes the nutrient of the new movement forward. And um, um, I don't think I've, I mean, I, in the early days when I was at, uh, when I was a Pujari, I did a lot of meditation in the morning. I spent, uh, spent uh, I would say, uh, the first 30 minutes of all of my pujas in meditation and quietude and for the first seven years. And then after that, I, uh, I am rarely quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I wouldn't say uh, I'm noisy, but you know, uh, I'm I'm just not quiet. I am. There's silence has has place in me, but simultaneously it comes with a uh, 
A lot of vibration. So you're saying like you're usually singing a song, like in terms of not being quiet or usually like talking or engaging or connecting? Singing, if I'm not singing, I'm paying attention to my breath. My breath is present. If I am not uh, paying attention to my breath, I'm playing an instrument, I'm drumming, I am, uh, if I'm doing Bagua circles, probably the most quiet that uh, I would get would be if I'm doing a Bagua circle that is not accompanied by vocalizing. <laughs> <laughs> so you play with sound, mm -hmm. whether it's an instrument or uh, your voice, absolutely. and yeah, absolutely, okay. yeah. That's that's my meditation process. Yeah. So I have a question for you both. Mm, sure. There's something that I hear in the Chinese practices that I've been exposed to recently and the difference between meditative you you have a delineation or discuss meditative art and martial art and i find that unusual and wonder if there's anything you want to share uh, about that uh, your whether it's your own personal practices what you tend toward or what it is for you the difference between meditative and martial that delineation to me is unusual cool yeah tony um well martial martial definitely is about the exercising of power and uh uh, in the Bagua school that I outward practice, power, outward power okay. for sure, in, in, in exerting effort outward, and uh, Marshall has to do with uh, with exercising your Mars, which is being active, being being more on the on the outward pouring of effort as opposed to the internal pouring of effort and. Of the past, the past 15, 16 years, I've been practicing the healing palms aspect of Bagua, which is the more meditative and less, uh, less martial, less uh, uh, exerting the power outward, but taking the power in for personal healing and the healing of others. And uh, yeah, martial, martial implies combat. Martial implies uh, conquest and uh, Meditative implies healing and uh, internal growth. And uh, most, most martial artists towards they graduate into becoming healing artists because uh, we say the, the, the healing point and the killing point are the same. The, the only difference is pressure. So the, if you're exercising too much pressure on a pressure point, you will break it. If you exercise just enough pressure, you will heal it. So that's, that's the big difference. And most martial arts, most, most martial artists that have been exercising a lot of power outward, they have to come to the meditative and healing practices because it does not come without a cost because you have definitely ruined your joints and mm -hmm. your tendons you've you put a lot of energy out without bringing any energy in so you're paying for it and it's uh it's not easy to <laughs> in my personal experience i i in trying to reach my potential as a martial artist i and get the most out of like training uh and youth and time I realized that I was breaking myself and essentially killing myself. And I had to come to the realization that I wasn't nourishing enough or I didn't have the intention of of nourishing and that was a and that was a meditative process to come to that realization and then try to uh, after having that paradigm shift then moving forward um yeah so and then uh and then also reflecting on conflict violence um and uh, externally and then also internally mm. is a meditative practice in terms of harmonizing with the with the with the shadow and with the dark corners corners of oneself you can't help but uh, be meditative and and 
explore those meditative processes. Otherwise, you go crazy. <laughs> mm-hmm. yes, absolutely. And, and you will be walking defeated within your own body because then your body will crap out on you. And you don't have the, the, the structure to keep you together because you've put all the structure, mm-hmm. you've compromised all your structure by exercising your force outwards. Yeah, and, and I know, and I understand, and I look through, when I look through the history, in terms of conflict and violence, uh, I do understand, uh, we may often think, you know, we're being attacked or whatnot, and in the animal kingdom, we do have to be conscious of predators in terms of, like, humans as animals. We can we can be preyed upon in, in the animal kingdom, it's not really, and there's no... Um, Nothing against the other animals themselves. They're not going through the same intellectual process of predation that, you know, human that we, we, they're just hungry. We don't anthropomorph. We, yeah, we can't anthropomorphize, you know, the animals and their intentions and processes. Yeah. Exactly. They're just hungry. However, in the forest, you know, we're, you're going to defend yourself and try to defend yourself, which is why we banded together. Yep. Yeah. Wow. So there's that process in, in terms of making your body strong and then also cultivating the the atten- the awareness and the focus to deliver a, a a killing blow if needed if that had to if that had to come you know I it happens it, people people encounter wild animals in in the forest and we all live on the land some mm. of us encounter them in our houses <laughs> she had a fox in her house oh my god through the cat door <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> chase the cat right in <laughs> well i want to thank you guys for for coming in today i really appreciated the the conversation i love the fact that we talked about the land and the the stewarding of the land and, and got to introduce the stewarding of the self and the overlap there and the caretaking yes. caretaking yeah 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 well i Beautiful. hope i wish uh you're um wishing you um a good journey on on your practices and and your overlaps thank you can Beautiful. i uh, i'd like to uh just let the listeners yeah. know that on this coming Saturday, me and my buddy Nick Peters, who's coming up from Redwood City, we're going to be playing at Jippo oh, down Saturday. in Shelter Cove. Yes. So today's Thursday. What time? To, uh, five to uh, eight o'clock or nine o'clock. Five to so. eight Saturday yeah. Jippo. So oh, excellent! Join us. It'll be we didn't some talk good ab- tunes. Also, we didn't talk about the uh, music, but it would it would be nice to explore that uh, because I've seen you guys with the the chanting and the Let's kirtan. keep rolling. Yeah. No, just <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, thank you again, and thank you, folks, for having us today and this has been chi talks with javi tony our guest today nari thanks again may your chi continue to flow smoothly until next time yay